Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure some of the discussions that were had in the previous panel, um, you know, might get echoed over here. Uh, many of these things are so closely interrelated. Uh, so my name is Chandra Bhatt. Uh, my area of research is uh, human behavior, human choices, how uh, we make decisions, can we mathematically model them? Um, primarily applied to uh, transportation choices, but more broadly to consumer choices. Um, so I am associated with the Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering Department, as well as the Department of Economics here at UT Austin. So uh, we'll get started with um, a couple of uh, lightning presentations. One of that is uh, going to be given by Dave Niyogi. So let's uh, start from that, and after the two lightning uh, presentations, we will invite uh, two individuals, Mark Kudot and Joe Falk, who are uh, in the Austin area to provide uh, some additional insights uh, in this particular panel. So uh, the panel is AI and surveillance in smart cities. Uh, so our first uh, lightning talk will be given by Dr. Niyogi. He is a professor in the Department of Ge Geological Sciences at UT Austin, as well as the Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering Department. Uh, he is uh, a part of the Team Organizing Committee for Planet Texas 2020 Grand Challenge. He has co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed papers and is a highly cited researcher. So Dave, all yours. Thank you. So I don't have uh, slides. Good morning. Uh, one of the things I, I heard from the previous panel was this whole aspect about where we need to go from beyond data scientists and computer scientists to try and develop something which is much more ethical, which is much more functional in terms of what we need to do with the system and the integration of social. When that happens, when we have data scientists, computer scientists, social scientists, uh, environmental climate folks get together and start looking into a cultural lens or it look at it from a technology lens, that's where we start creating something which looks like a smart city. And so smart city as a framework has been around for a while. It has been essentially looked upon it as what we look at a smartphone or a smart car, something which will have technology, but hopefully it will not have its own mind like my cell phone has. And there is something we could do more with it in terms of the decisions, in terms of the outcomes that come up with it. So I want to highlight three things. First, why do we even have cities? Traditionally, cities have come up because they are seats of economic development. Uh, cities typically, if you look around in terms of the data, depending on what kind of analysis you look at, they provide a one is to 10 at least return on investments. So when you put a dollar, you get $10 out of it through some sort of a uh, economic feedback that goes on. Cities have therefore promulgated in the context of being seats of economic drivers. So that's why we have cities. Second, cities have created identity. Uh, when you think of New Orleans, you perhaps think of something. When you think of Austin, you perhaps think of something weirdly. When you think of uh, Paris, you perhaps think of something else. So they have a culture associated with it. And then you also have an expectation of services that happen. If I'm sitting within a city boundary, I need my trash to come. I need my power to be there 24 seven, storm or no storm. I need to have certain services that are part of what I expect. Now this is where the smartness of the city starts getting gauged, that whether by integration of technology, each of these primary metric that we come up with, economic, cultural, services, and any other that might emerge with a part of that, actually starts getting enhanced. And in the context of that, we actually start seeing some more features that we were not able to achieve before. And that could be in the context of what we are now looking with regards to things like, uh, say for instance, with the whole discussion of I-35 redesign, how can we not just have better mobility, but in doing so, we create an opportunity for a better environment, a better climate, and achieving many other things which we could have not achieved traditionally. So that becomes one part. 
The second part of that, what I want to highlight, is we are very keen in being objective in our decisions. We pride ourselves that I'm not going to do an emotional decision, I'm going to do a data-driven decision based on facts, based on science. But that is good as long as we have equally available, equitable data across regions. Very often what we have is that we only have data in regions which have resources. And other times we have stories, and my colleague here will be talking about data and stories. So when we have limited data, one of the way we have been looking into the smart city framework is how do we create data that is equitably available across the city by creating the power of AI and machine learning and so forth, such that we have what I call SIMBI, climate in my backyard. I'm no longer just using the airport data to decide on somebody's health exposure somewhere away from it. And when they have been saying, we are having issues with the children that are growing, we are having issues with our health, and somebody do with it, and we don't have the data. So we create that data in your backyard, so that is the power of machine learning, AI, and sensors, and technology, and what we call Internet of Things, edge technology, whatever you want to call it. But this integration is what makes this city smarter, that we now have choices for people to work with. Now, one of the things we have been doing is a fire digital tool. So for instance, the Austin Fire Department tells us where the fire is happening. We take that data, put it on the system, create 3D maps, try to create public exposure in terms of what could be happening for schools, people who might have asthma, people who might be doing some activities which might be affected. The third part I would like to say is with regards to creating the integration of stakeholders and decision tools in what we call the digital twins. We had this big workshop in Cambridge just last week uh, in terms of uh, what is digital twins. And this was principally, I would say, 95% people who came from math and computer science framework. And one of the consistent that emerged, I feel, is without a stakeholder, a digital twin is just numbers and algorithms. And the stakeholders come from the context of decisions we are trying to come up with. And so I think from the smart city perspective, what we are trying to do is the integration of technology, culture, and choices that we are trying to achieve here. And when we get all that right, whether it could be in part of one location or the whole city, we think we are becoming smarter. Now, people often feel that is this only for new cities, like uh, let's say parts of Singapore that have been developing or parts of uh, Austin that are still evolving. The reality is cities are living entities. They are constantly growing, they're constantly breathing, they're constantly changing. And so every decision that comes up, there we have an ability to be smarter by trying to think about it in the smart city perspective. Also, I'll stop there and um, let my colleague discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dave. Um, talking about data and collecting data, uh, it's a good segue to our next lightning talk by Emily Woodward on being watched. Uh, and that's the way you collect data in some ways, uh, embedding ethics in public cameras. Uh, Emily Woodward is an MA candidate at the UT Austin School of Journalism and Media and a graduate research assistant at the Technology and Information Policy Institute. She has conducted research on issues surrounding privacy, data policies and data governance and civic engagement related to the use of public camera systems. So, Emily, all yours. Um, oh, is, is it on? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Emily Woodward. I'm a master's student in the School of Journalism and Media at UT Austin. Um, and I've been lucky to be a part of this project for the last um, almost two years now, working with Dr. Sharon Strober, who was up at, here in the previous session. Um, so what I prepared is a just a brief overview of some of the research, the highlights of our research in the last um, year and a half, really. Um, so first, I wanted to introduce our project team. And um, part, a core part of this project is that it's very interdisciplinary. So we're working with um, people from our department and journalism and media, from the iSchool, um, from computer science and engineering. Um, so we've really been able to bring a diverse um, set of perspectives and disciplines to this research project. Um, and our core research questions, um, they've really centered on um, you know, assessing how citizens and municipal um, departments 
view and conceptualize privacy in relation to these technology systems. Oh, um, oops. Well, the next few questions um, are really about um, data management and data practices, and also really considering how um, we can enhance citizen practices um, in relation to these technologies. Um, so a real highlight of the last year was we've developed a co-design workshop, um, which we presented now at two conferences. The first one was um, we got to travel to um, Portugal, to Guimarães, and we um, held a workshop there working with policymakers um, and a diverse um, group of participants at that workshop. And the last one, this actually took place last month at MozFest. Um, we got to work with um, activists and policymakers to really think about um, some of the ethical challenges related to smart city technologies. And the, the purpose of these workshops was really to um, invite participants to have comments and um, design potential solutions. So what we did was um, we had a set of case studies and we walked participants through the ethical challenges related to um, some hypothetical cases that were developed based on actual scenarios we've seen in cities throughout our research. Um, and participants were able to um, co-design privacy solutions and interventions um, related to these technology systems. A, another core component of our research has been conducting focus groups. So we have conducted six focus groups to date um, with a variety of citizen groups throughout Austin. So um, from community leaders and activists to um, younger adults, older adults. Um, we've also talked to tech workers. Um, and we've also talked to um, more activists who are working really on these issues at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So what we really heard through these interviews is that there is an, a large awareness gap when it comes to these technologies. So um, many participants weren't really aware of the extent of, to which these technologies are being used by various city departments. They really assume that they are constantly being monitored and that there's data being collected about them you know, from private entities and public entities as they go about their everyday lives. But um, when it comes to these types of technologies, what we really heard was there's a lack of awareness around them. Um, and to really understand how these technology systems are being implemented and procured in city departments, what we've done is we've we identified a particular city department in Austin to conduct an in-depth case study. So that was with the Austin Public Library, and we're lucky to have Joe Falk here who was actually part of the um, part of this case study with us? So um, that has been really, in, really interesting to you know talk to different. We talked to different um, teams within the library to understand how they are interacting with these technologies and negotiating the benefits and um, potential risks associated with using them in public spaces such as the library. And here are a couple of photos from our visit to the library. We got a tour of the library um, and got to see where some of the cameras were placed throughout the building. And in terms of our outcomes, we are expecting to um, produce a conference paper and we will have a panel at um, the ICA conference um, in May. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. Um, let's now welcome um, two uh, other folks over here, uh, Mark and Joe. Mark is the Climate Resilience and Adaptation Manager of the City of Austin Office of Resilience. He works with city departments to embed climate adaptation strategies into long-term operations and asset management. And in this role, he also supports community organizers to incre increase climate resilience in the Eastern Crescent. And uh, Emily referred to Joe. Joe is the Director of Technology for the Austin Public Library System. He's a technology leader. 
He has over 35 years of experience in technology, 24 of which he has served as the director of technology for the Austin Public Library. Wow, that's a whole long time. Thank you, Joe. Uh, he's played a key role in the design and implementation of the library's technology infrastructure, and his leadership was crucial in the development of the city's central library. So we certainly look forward to some of your research insights uh, that um, add to, uh, and your practical insights that add to what has already been discussed. Um, so the, we, we'll keep this pretty informal and open. We have some discussions, uh, we have some questions over here, uh, but we'll allow it to flow as things come up. But uh, to, to start off uh, some of the discussion, uh, Joe and Mark, can you talk to us about some potential benefits and harms of AI-based surveillance and infrastructure planning technologies in smart cities? How can cities build trust and foster transparency with citizens? Joe, uh, Emily referred to you and the work that uh, we have been doing with you uh, in, for the public library case study. How did that go? What were some of the results? And can you identify some very specific benefits that are being implemented today, not in the future? And some of the risks you see today, not necessarily in the future. I think we can talk about the future in abstract terms, but I'd like to ping your mind about what has been happening today. Sure. Um, I think back about what Craig said, it's more about what you don't know. You know, I think it was leading to, you know, everything that you do understand, you really find out the more you don't know. Um, the central library is a pretty large building, so, um, you know, initially I can tell you from the beginning, there was absolutely no thought giving to AI or anything associated with security or surveillance at that building. It's literally coverage. Um, and uh, what we can, how we can protect assets. Uh, a bureaucracy, thinking back to the second panel, everything they mentioned, that's very complicated. Well, everybody that's designing, purchasing, installing, uh, choosing where the camera's pointed, what the camera's focus is on, all of those people took none of that into consideration. So we're five years past that now, and the whole world has changed for the better. Uh, but yes, how do, you, how do we get that level of engagement into everybody? Because it's not just the designing of the data or the designing of the camera. That's not it. It's the people side of it. Uh, it always comes back to the people, the people that are doing the purchasing. You know, even purchasing policies within a city have to change. That, that has to evolve to supplement the good work that everybody's doing for that end goal, and it gets radically beneficial, all of that creation of the technology, the, the cameras, the everything. That all gets uh, more and more critical as time passes on, but it's exponentially getting better and better and better. What we're leaving behind is the people side, in my estimation, and the, the person that has to engage in making the choices of which to choose, making the choices of where to point cameras, making the choices of when to use cameras. So that'd be where I'd say that's the main point. And, and Mark, your experience, uh, again, the same issue, what have you seen as some clear benefits that you're seeing today in this evolution process. So good morning. Um, I, I've been with the city about 13 years. Most of that time has been working with um, our assets and operations, so Austin Energy, Austin Water, Watershed Protection, Public Works, Transportation, a lot of different departments on about how climate change is going to impact their systems and their regular work. And I'm thinking about how Austin Energy, Austin Water, Transportation Department, and Emergency Management have rooms about this big, full of screens, full of sensors that show exactly what's going on at any one time. And they're constantly looking for ways to make it more efficient, make it better, more real time, make right decisions at the right time. 
most data that we need has to be tied to decision making for it to make sense. So we're constantly trying to make things better. About six years ago, I was so focused on like how to make things better. Council asked, what about the community? So I was thinking, you know, I feel pretty good. Like I know what's going on. I feel confident. I'm an expert on resilience. I go to the community and they're like, what are you talking about? Like we already are resilient. We're living through these events every day. All these systems you're talking about are impacting us in the worst way. We're being flooded, we're losing power when we need it, et cetera. And I realized everything I was doing had unintended consequences that I had to switch. So on the one hand, the good things we're doing is that we are updating our systems to be more efficient, to be better. Mm. But climate change is throwing that out the window. Like we have an energy system that is not designed for ice. It's not designed for cold weather because we live in the south. Like we are, have to be rethinking about everything. At the same time, we have community members with the least amount of resources getting impacted much worse and more specifically by all these systems. So we have to balance that. And what we're thinking about now and with the help of Dev Miyogi and Patrick Bixler is looking at like how do we switch that conversation? How do we get the data collection in the hands of the community and not solely with our engineers? Because one thing we start thinking about is no data without stories, no stories without data, right? If we're taking data, how does it connect to the people's lives? If we're talking about people's lives, how do we get them the data to make the right, make, tell us to make the right decision? So we're constantly sort of having these discussions with community members, with engineers, with staff to figure out how to make it better going forward. So good point, Matt. So the, the issue of <clears throat> ensuring that our data represents the diversity of everyday life over there. I think it was also brought up in the previous uh, panel. Um, so the issue, it, it brings up how can we incorporate the stories? How can we have the human voice incorporated? Um, in my own area of research, um, a reporter from KXN asked me just a few days back, what do you think about the express link? Is it good or is it bad? You know, and I was trying to say, I can't give you a straight answer on that, right? It depends. The perspectives are so varied, and every perspective would be, can be uh, legitimately appropriate. So one of the issues that raises, though, is we talk about ladders of opportunity for all. We talk about equity. So a question for all of you, we are a heterogeneous people. How do we, you know, handle that heterogeneity and talk about equity and good for all? Dave, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, I mean, it starts with the whole thing, like there are things you can change and things you can't change. And there are certainly things we can change, and it starts like this. Let's take a case where you are looking at a heat wave that is coming to Austin. Climate is a great, you know, unifier equalizer. That heat wave does not affect everyone equally, as you know that. At an individual level, I don't like walking in sun. Some people enjoy running in sun. Uh, some communities actually are way more impacted by that heat than others. In fact, there are data there that being a homeless is perhaps more healthier than living in a household which has poor design and because your nighttime heat is going to be so much higher, it is going to have your long-term health impact and even short-term shocks to your system. So how do we actually collect this data? That's where we start looking into systems and integration of technology, and then we start finding out that where can we introduce some changes that they can then propagate down to the decisions that Mark was talking about. So this is a case of where we know things are not equal, we are heterogeneous, we start creating data that can help create that story, which can help the city create those decisions. And then we back propagate to see what is the impact of that and then try to see the value that emerges from there. So I think to answer your question, how do we go about it, is first of all identifying the levers where we can actually use technology to create those exemplars, show the value of that, try and replicate that, and then see if it's scaled up value can be something that can be supported and out of that emerges a few more things. It could be public health good, it could not just be the change in housing and so forth. 
So I think that's one way, but I'm sure there are other avenues about how uh, this could evolve. Right. Yeah, understanding the value it, it is great. I think there's one other step there, understanding what uh, the negative of uh, being creative. Uh, if, if there's security cameras in an environment, does that change behavior? Does, are people less creative, you know, things like that? So they, we need to, those soft, those soft impacts need to be pushed down to the, to the end user as well. They need to understand how life is changed by all these smart systems paying attention to everything that we do. So you talked about being watched, you know, and it, Joe was also referring to the security, privacy, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a binary, but people can have different preferences or different thought processes along those two lines. What have you found in your research? Yeah, I think specifically about the security privacy trade-off, that is something that came up throughout our focus groups. Um, you know, people really kind of grappling with that and it really, their responses really depended on the context um, of the scenario that they were discussing. So they might emphasize security more in certain circumstances and emphasize privacy um, more in others. Um, I think when it comes to equity, I guess what I can offer also from our project is um, We've seen in some cities um, more efforts to really involve citizens in the process of um, procuring these technologies and um, developing policies to govern the data associated with them. So, um, you know, in Portland, we've seen they have the city of Portland has um, experimented with kind of a co-design approach to their data policies and. Um, inviting citizens into the process of defining that. And that's a form of educating citizens about the um, potential harms of these technologies and um, really giving them a voice in the process. So we've seen some cities across the US start to um, explore ways to do that. Or you know, another, um, another example we've seen is um, citizen oversight boards. So um, I think when it comes to equity, inviting citizens to give input is um, a potential intervention. So, so you know, you're talking about inviting citizens to provide input. And uh, Mimi in the previous panel was talking about how many people feel like they are invisible in the sense that their input is not being valued as much as it should be. So Mark, when you go out to the community and you try to get input, how have you handled this notion from the other end potentially, hey, you're not anyway going to listen to me. Why do I care? How have you gone past that to build a little bit of trust? Yeah. Um, there, there's a long history of mistrust with the city and it's well-founded. Um, to your question about is it managed lanes, like if you're going to put in managed lanes and somebody comes to you and says, you know, what should we be thinking about? I think the first question is who benefits? So using maps and using data to figure out who benefits from that, from going from point A to point B. But the second question is who's it, what are the unintended consequences? And what I tend to hear when I go to the community is, you know, since they put in this infrastructure, my asthma rates have gone up or my child has felt more headaches or it's very sort of like emotional responses because you know that's what they're experiencing. And we have a tendency at the city, and this is broad brush, that you know, oh, it's maybe it's just you, or you know, it's it's not, it's hard to connect those two, or it's very broad. And I I think that there's two problems. One is the city has a tendency to look at the squeaky wheel, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. The people who have the most amount of confidence to bug the city are people with higher education, generally. You know, people feel confident that I got to call up my, my council member and say X, Y, and Z. It's not people who have two jobs and I don't have time to deal with that. The second piece is, you know, how do we empower the community to have that confidence to go to council? How do we stand in for them and go to council and say, hey, we've talked to these community members. It's real. Take it, you know, take it, for, take it seriously. The other piece of that is how do you actually get the tools in their hands? Put in the air quality sensors next to the managed lane. Put in 
heat sensors, put in other sensors. So they go to council and be like, look, we have the data. We know it's real. Here it is. Here's what you should do. And then empowering them to be like, tell council, do X, Y, and Z. Just do it. And that is how you get things to change. If you don't empower community members, you're expecting us, city staff, to make those decisions. I'm not that smart. This issue about listening, uh, I'll tell you a story quickly. When I started my first job as a state climatologist in Indiana, uh, I was very new, and I asked my uh, predecessor, what, what do I do? What is one piece of advice you'll have? And he said one word, listen. If you can just listen, you will be able to do everything you want to do. And I think that's probably the best advice in almost many situations that I can think of. And we have done that. And one instance I'll give you about a smart city actually listening to its citizens and trying to do something uh, is a uh, city called Bangalore, which you're very well aware of, uh, Bangalore as it's called. It's the Silicon Valley of India. It's uh, what Austin is now on this side, which is I think called the Silicon Hill, I believe. Uh, now, the managed issue with that city was it was a great garden city, which has really become a population boom because of technology started having expansion, and then having all sorts of environmental problem. Does it sound familiar to what is happening in Austin? Exactly. Now, so there, working with certain companies, uh, we started developing a flood warning system, because every time it rained, there used to be flooding. So they said, we need data. So we started putting sensors there. We put sensors on locations, work with emergency management, to the point we have a beautiful system which sends a forecast to the local data integration, to a cell phone which goes to a policeman at a particular corner and tells this is how you're going to block this road or here you expect flooding. Now this worked great on a system. In reality, we still had problems. And when we started investigating it further, what happened we realized is that the models that we consider for where you're going to have flooding, inundation and so forth, did not consider one part. In India, it rains only few months so in other nine months, it doesn't rain. So what happens to those canals? They get filled up with trees, debris, and so forth. And so whenever there's even a small rain, instead of going down, it was starting to fill up. Now, how did we know this? By talking to people who were telling us, this is the problem. The problem is not we're getting rains. The problem is nobody cleaning this up. And so when we started putting that information, the system started to work better. In fact, now instead of flood warning, that system is also being used to use for street cleaning before the monsoon and so forth. So that's an example of listening. The other quick one that we are doing in Austin is with regards to the fire. That when there is a report of a fire, where that smoke is going, part of it is we can do by sensors, but a lot of it is by these sensors. And these sensors, people hear and talk and tweet and mention, and that data goes, and then that starts getting and triggering the system. So it's a full system. So, so you know, you're talking about sensors, meaning basically the human senses, the eyes, the ears, etc., and the whole idea of listening. So just two thoughts that come to mind. The first is, um, how do we get the people, the, pro, the, the a good diversity of people in the first place, to be able to listen, right? Right? Uh, and I'd like to have some thoughts on that. And the second issue, it was interesting. Craig and I were talking about how Microsoft is planning to have um, our meetings basically recorded, but more than recorded, uh, essentially spit out a summary of uh, the meetings. You know, action items, who said what, whatever, whatever. And we were thinking, gosh, that's wonderful. You know, we can save so much of human resources uh, in someone jotting it down, you know, typing it up, et cetera, if, some, if, if there's a AI that spits that out. But at the same time, going back to Mimi's point, there's also a good bit of academic literature and other literature that suggests that in meetings, um, some segments of the population, people of color, they feel like as though whatever they're saying is not being listened to. Uh, and some, someone else says the same thing, a few minutes later, and it gets a whole lot of traction. So, you know, my question to you is, how do we first get the right people? You talked you talk about focus groups, um, uh, but maybe there are certain sections of the population who can't come to those focus groups. How do we get there? How do we, you know, uh, how, how do we ping those people? And the second is, lots of benefits of AI. 
uh, and how do we harness those benefits without negatively impacting any of the things that we should not be pursuing? Mark, and then um, Joe. Yeah, it's, it's a heavy question. Um, I want to sort of give a good shout out to the Office of Equity at the City of Austin, who sort of transformed how we think about community engagement. Um, now, after sort of this internal work that we've tried to do, is really look at how do we create these systems going forward. And one of the things we start to do is whenever we have a project or a program, we automatically create this community advisory committee to see like, okay, so this is what we want to do, this is our process, what do you think? Have them look at the data, have them sort of help us through this process so there are no unintended consequences. But then also ask the question of like, who should be at the table and have them sort of help us identify those people. We do tend to talk to the people who are able to show up, who you know, are paid to show up, or you know, are really engaged. But we have to do the, sort of the next step of seeing who's not engaged, who doesn't normally active, sort of participate in this process, who is highly mistrustful of the city, people who are undocumented, people who, who have a long history of having these impacts, getting them to the table and sort of walking them through the process and always be transparent. But the other piece of that is that it creates that trust, right? Because we sort of collaborate at the speed of trust, but that speed isn't constant, right? It elevates, it goes really much faster the more trust you have. So they get to the point where you're like texting people like, hey, this community member, like I know them, like what do you think of this? And we sort of talk to each other constantly. So once you build that trust, then you can start to sort of build things together. My comment though, and in, to your discussion about like how do you leverage AI, I sometimes think, and you know, you can get mad at me for saying this, but sometimes it feels like it's a solution looking for a problem. But the benefits of working with these community members is that they have great ideas, they are th constantly thinking about innovative new ideas. How do we harness that sort of ingenuity and sort of think about how do you tie what the community needs to what AI can help them with? And I think that's really the, the fun and innovative piece of it. You have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I was, my uh, first thing that came to mind was, okay, I'm at a library. That is a public library, and there are public libraries. There's 20 of them plus the central library all over town. And this city will be engaged in uh, the changes that are taking place in libraries, the type of facilities that are there. If you've been to the central library, you know that it is completely different than the other libraries in town. Well, as the city invests dollars in a place that is open to everybody for communication, for uh, uh, discussion, uh, how that building is designed matters. Uh, what resources we make available, it's not just the book anymore, it is more about the community there as an engaged community. And uh, Mark and his office can hold that it's a natural place within communities where some of that dialogue can be held, whether it be uh, coming from Mark or coming from some nonprofit group. Uh, and then related to the AI side, I would say, uh, so surveillance, if you just, you know, I told you that the security cameras at Central, they're just put in just for surveillance. I mean, for, uh, you know, where they were sitting, what they were looking at was all that anybody paid attention to at the time. Um, now, the first part of AI starting to come into the library is people counting. Oh, they can count. You know, you can, you can get a statistic on, from the security camera on counting how many people are there. Well, those unintended consequences that come as that creeps in from just people counting to, oh, now recognition of what, uh, what people are wearing or or whatever, and how does that change the society that is walking in that building? And how do we make sure that we don't do things just because we can? Emily, um, in your focus group, how have you been able to reach uh, what you believe to be uh, a diversity of the population? And um, any thoughts on uh, how we can, again, go back to the question that was dealt with in the previous panel, uh, ensure that AI doesn't replicate potential implicit biases of humans? Yeah, I think, well, you know, getting 
engaging a diverse set of citizens, even for our focus groups, was definitely a challenge that we um, were confronted with. And it's something we discussed with participants in our focus groups as well, primarily our, our group um, of engaged citizens and activists. That was a topic that came up in that group. Um, and, you know, in terms of our own recruitment for those focus groups and just in, just for the purpose of talking to people about their perceptions of these technologies, um, we were reaching out to groups um, and trying to, you know, um, connect with them and invite different people in. But while we did, were able to provide a stipend, it is really difficult to access um, and, you know, get people um, in, in the space and out of work or, you know, whatever obligations they have. So I think that that's definitely a, a real challenge. Um, so I agree with everything that Mark said around that. Um, and, and something that was coming up for me when you were talking, Joe, um, was, well, we know from our work with the library that the cameras that are used in library do have facial recognition capabilities, but they're turned off completely. Um, and something interesting that came up for us when talking to the uh, librarians was we were, we were talking to um, a group of frontline staff at the library who really work with citizens on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're the ones um, you know, helping uh, patrons. And um, what we heard from them was that they feel that the cameras are really more reactive than proactive in terms of how they um, keep the public space safe and um, perform their jobs as librarians. So um, I think what that really told us was while there are while there is a use for technology in these spaces, there's there are certain um, you know things that only a human who has this knowledge of that space and um, these relationships with one another in that space can actually do in terms of um, you know their familiarity with the people that come every single day and knowing their, you know, who the regular patrons are and things like that. So that was definitely something that came up throughout our conversations with the librarians. Thank you all. Uh, we have a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience. Any of you, any thoughts, questions? Um, thank you. Uh, I would love to see it for enforcement of traffic laws where there's egregious violations. Uh, but I know in the Netherlands, you're not allowed to have cameras pointed at the public or something. So you can't have a doorbell camera and things like that that face the public street. And I was wondering how many places in the world have, have tr turned down that opportunity um, to rely on cameras to help. I know the city of Austin Police Department and probably many others are using uh, next door posts with uh, video of people trying to break into homes and things like that. And so there's that, that line. Uh, so I don't know, Dev, maybe you could start. I'd be curious what you'd, you'd like to say, and, and I bet everybody else has an opinion as well. Well, I don't know much about uh, policing and other things, but I'll just say technology, when done right, is a beautiful thing, right? I mean, it's, it's like when we think of art, I think we often think of technology now. I think community trust is what I've learned is it's not a module you add. It's like a plant. It's, it's, a, it's something you cultivate over a period of time. How have we done this? We have done it in the context of uh, being embedded with that community, uh, going to learn rather than provide advice was one. Second was in the context of you know developing that trust, whether it is for camera or it is for sensors, saying that this is not for something which is monitoring, but to create options and solutions. And one good way I would say is that where we have been talking about, say, the heat in the city. Mark mentioned that. And one option has been that, okay, you can put green roofs, but that is not feasible everywhere. So providing to them what are the options that are available and then using AI to sort of like create a video game perspective of what would the city look like if we were to do these greening options and what it would do in terms of reducing the heat and making that available, making that future now through technology builds that potential of trust. And so one could use imaging, imagery, camera, whatever you want to do to create data sets and so forth. 
but show that the end goal here is them, not us. And we are them is the other part I would go with. But there are some other examples I'm sure that will emerge here. Let's say any other. Would you be success if you're successful in, in communicating very um, uh, uses of technology with integrity that people are more likely to accept the use of technology and if they're blindsided by it but their, their first in, uh, if your first uh, impact is from a ring doorbell situation where there was something that went strange from that ring, ring doorbell and you felt like that person got their privacy was abused then the public's going to be less likely to to adapt to it so we need to do so much more up front before we ever implement those technologies and that's what we sort of heard earlier is it's what really needs to happen is all this pre-work needs to be done with the right mindset Another question there a question for uh, Professor Nioji. Um, appreciate we're talking about cities, but the way we're framing that, you're automatically leaving out a population of rural population. And also appreciate you, you said cities originally were formed for economic reasons. But as we start to learn more data, we can collect it more efficiently, we can spread sort of what we're talking around everywhere information comes in, data is collected from everywhere. Um, can you see a reversal of that tendency where decades from now, a century from now, the impetus to form cities is different? As it kind of was during COVID, people, <laughs> I mean, it didn't change cities, but people moved out. Um, so it's just a large question of cities and, and whether they will still look the same in the future if we extrapolate these trends. Yeah, I think uh, the future panel will be talking about, the next panel will be talking about the future of workforce. And I believe in that there will be this context of you know, mobility and what cities can provide with economic aspects. I would say from climate perspective, one of the examples we always highlight is that if you want to simulate the thunderstorms or environment over city, you need to get the rural area correct. Because getting those soil moisture, those other fields are important. That's just from a very practical perspective. From the context of a social system, I think city is as good as what it is not. And by that I mean it cannot be what it is not able to provide. It is not something that we want to build up into a future. So COVID was a great example where people moved away, uh, technology was helpful, but again there is now this potential where we might have a merged cities of some sort. I don't think there is an answer yet about what cities are going to be. Some say it is a 10-minute city, 15-minute city. Mobility becomes a factor for what we want to do. But I would love to hear what a few, the next panel has to say about workforce and how the cities would be playing a part in that. And of course, we now have the concept of mega cities and going beyond that, but a very good question on that uh, front, the very label of smart city. Should it be something rather than smart city? Uh, the, concept of smart state, you know, where do you go? What's the adjective, you know, the adjective is there, the smart, but what should it be? The, is it a neighborhood? Is it a city? Um, open questions, which we'll continue to discuss in the next panel. We are running out of time, but please join me in thanking this panel for their <laughs> insights. Uh, and what I'd like to do is we are going to float seamlessly into the next panel. Um, maybe take about a minute or so once again to stretch, stand up um, as the uh, you know, members of the next panel come forward.